Dzień dobry Państwu. Czy mnie słychać? Tak, chyba tak. Szanowni Państwo, szanowni państwo zacznijmy wobec tego. Pozwolę sobie przywitać Państwa. Szanowni Państwo, szacowni goście, profesorowie i wykładowcy, drodzy koleżanki i koledzy i kochani studenci. Wydarzenie Young Textile Art Triennal wpisało się już w rzeczywistość naszej uczelni jako coś stałego, powtarzalnego, ale również niosącego za sobą taki powiew świeżości i ekscytacji, związanej między innymi z możliwością wymiany doświadczeń i, yy, i poglądów. Przypomnę, że ITAT odbywa się po raz czwarty od 2013 roku i że za każdym razem organizowany jest przez pedagogów związanych z Akademią Sztuk Pięknych w Łodzi, a dokładniej z edukacją w dziedzinie tkaniny artystycznej. Początkowo był organizowany przez Wydział Tkaniny i Ubioru, a obecnie przez Instytut Tkaniny, Druku i Stylizacji Wnętrz na Wydziale Sztuk Projektowych, którego mam przyjemność być dziekaną. Oraz, że pomysłodawcą, a właściwie pomysłodawczynią i pierwszą organizatorką pierwszych edycji była profesor Lidia Choczaj, której jesteśmy wdzięczni za ogrom włożonej pracy. Bardzo Państwa poproszę o brawa dla pani profesor, która jest tutaj z nami i której bardzo dziękujemy. Dziękuję bardzo. Przypomnę również, że tradycje odbywających się przy okazji itatu, wykładów i sympozjów sięga początków wydarzenia i że już w 2016 roku odbyło się pierwsze międzynarodowe sympozjum Młoda Tkanina, edukacja, stan aktualny, kierunki rozwoju i prognozy na przyszłość. Partnerami dzisiejszego święta Tkaniny Młodych są... Centralne Muzeum Włókiennictwa, które było pomysłodawcą dzisiejszego sympozjum oraz Miejska Galeria Sztuki w Łodzi, która gości wystawę pokonkursową, na której wernisarz dzisiaj o godzinie 16 serdecznie Państwa zapraszam. Przypomnę również, że nasze wydarzenie jest wydarzeniem towarzyszącym 17. Międzynarodowemu Triennale Tkaniny w Łodzi, organizowanemu przez Centralne Muzeum Włókiennictwa oraz że patronat honorowy nad nim objęli Ministerstwo Kultury i Dziedzictwa Narodowego, wojewoda łódzki pan Tobiasz Boheński, pan Grzegorz Schreiber, marszałek województwa łódzkiego i pani Hanna Zdanowska, prezydent miasta Łodzi. Chciałabym serdecznie podziękować wszystkim moim pracownikom zaangażowanym w organizację wydarzenia, a w szczególny sposób pani dyrektorce Instytutu Tkaniny, Druku i Stylizacji Wnętrz, dr Dominice Krogulskiej-Czekalskiej oraz kuratorce i organizatorce konkursu, a przede wszystkim niezwykle ciężko i z ogromnym zaangażowaniem pracującym nad, pracują, pracującej nad wszystkim pani magister Paulinie Sadrak. Poproszę o ogromne brawa dla Pani, bo naprawdę włożyły w to mnóstwo pracy. Dziękuję również pracownikom Centralnego Muzeum Włókiennictwa, którzy nas wspierali swoją wiedzą organizacyjną i podpowiadali rozwiązania w chwilach kryzysu, a szczególnie Pani Dyrektor Anecie Dalbiak i Pani Marcie Kowaleskiej. To również należą się brawa. Ogromnie mi miło zaprosić Państwa do obserwowania dzisiejszej dyskusji na temat znaczenia tkaniny artystycznej w dyskursie sztuki najnowszej, na rynku sztuki oraz w procesie kształtowania nowych pokoleń twórców. Moderatorem pierwszej części poświęconej dyskursowi sztuki najnowszej jest pani Marta Kowaleska, kurator Centralnego Muzeum Włókiennictwa w Łodzi. Panel poświęcony edukacji prowadzić będzie dyrektorka Instytutu Tkaniny, Druku i Stylizacji Wnętrz, dr Dominika Krogulska-Czekalska, a panel o znaczeniu tkaniny na rynku sztuki moderować będzie pan Jakub Gawkowski, kurator działu sztuki nowoczesnej Muzeum Sztuki w Łodzi. Zapraszam i życzę poruszających wypowiedzi i ciekawej dyskusji. Dziękuję bardzo. Hello. Tak 
Tak, jest mi niezmiernie miło, że państwo tutaj są z nami. Tak jak wspomniano, ten panel będzie dotyczył obecności medium tkaniny w, na wystawach i tutaj są kuratorki sztuki najnowszej, które tak naprawdę kreują kształt tkaniny artystycznej obecnie i są naszymi członkinami naszego jury, także również odpowiadają za kształt 17. edycji Międzynarodowego Triennale Tkaniny w Łodzi. I'm extremely happy <laughs> that uh, you are with us today and uh, thank you so much for um, participation in uh, our Triennale and uh, for, for coming to it. <laughs> And um, yes, this, this panel, I would, like to, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, your uh, curatorial practice and um, how you, uh, how you um, look like in the textile. <laughs> so um, I have three short questions. <laughs> uh, my first question is, why are we still talking about textile art? Uh, other, uh, other art disciplines don't add the medium. If you compare, of, for instance, with contemporary art of old masters, of our contemporary art or old masters, is there still going an emancipation proce processing going on? Thank you, Marta, and uh, thank you, everybody. Um, apologies for only speaking English for a start. <laughs> um, I hope that a lot of you can understand. I, I think for me, I can only really answer this question of why we're still talking about textile art from my own personal experience. Um, so I started as an assistant curator working at Tate Modern in London um, 20, about 20 years ago and I worked on lots of big exhibitions and at a certain point somebody who was my manager, uh, a more senior curator asked me, you know, do you have a specialist interest? Would you like to develop a specialist interest? Um, thinking about whether I would want to work with photography or a particular geographical region. And I said, well, you know, I've always been really interested in textile art. And he sort of looked at me a bit, really? <laughs> and, um, well, wouldn't it be better if you were working in the Museum of Design or in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which in London is where there's a big collection of decorative arts and crafts? And I looked back at him and was like, really? Are we really having this conversation? You know, I, I trained um, in art and fine art and art history at the University of Leeds with a very prominent feminist professor uh, Griselda Pollock and when I was originally a student myself was making work that related to the domestic environment to textiles and um, using textile media but also other media to represent textile ideas. Anyway, long story short, um, about 15 years later <laughs> and a new director of both Tate overall and a new director of Tate Modern, both of whom are women. And I was asked to work on an exhibition um, representing the work of Annie Albers. Would you like, Anne, would you like to go and research the work of Annie Albers? Yes, please. <laughs> Can I really do this? Are we really going to give a big exhibition space over to somebody who's basically their entire practice was in weaving? And not only that, she was, you know, one of the most major figures, one of the, one of the weavers who we all look to, um, who wrote about weaving, who theorized weaving, was trained at the Bauhaus, took the practice to the US. Um, so that, that was a real breakthrough 
in presenting that big exhibition in Tate Modern. And when the visitor walked into the exhibition, they saw a loom. And we thought about this and we thought, why, why would we do this? Why would we have a loom when you walk in? Because it's not like you walk into a Picasso exhibition and you have an easel. You know? <laughs> but we all know what it means to paint. We've all painted when we were children. You know, we all know what painting is, basically. We all know what sculpture is, basically. We don't necessarily understand what it means to construct a textile fabric on a loom. So we thought, OK, we're going to actually really get underneath this. We're going to explore what this means. But at the same time, we're going to highlight this artist who is able to express concepts, complicated ideas, through the construction of threads on a loom. So that, that's my way of answering it. Textile art, you know, we talk about performance art. It's a way to describe a particular strand of practice. But we all know, as Marta said, that artists now, they're not so concerned with what media they use, whether it's sculpture, painting, found objects, lens-based media, digital. It's all part and parcel of this practice. And I think it's, it's time that the museums and the institutions caught up. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm Mizuki. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I just want to um, briefly tell you the, um, the why I'm working for textiles, why we are still talking about the textile. My reason is totally opposite to and. <laughs> I was kind of trapped to um, work on these you know, topics because of the uh, art institution I'm working for as a director now. So um, I'm, I'm come from Hong Kong, and uh, I'm working for the uh, Center for Heritage Arts and Textile. Um, it's a very young institution, which was opened in March in 2019. Please go to next. So uh, please go to the next slide. Okay. So now it, Hong Kong is known as the financial hub in Hong Kong, but uh, Hong Kong was actually industrial hub uh, in East Asia between 1950s and uh, 1980s. And the textile industry, one of the driving force to make the Hong Kong as it is now. And uh, so this is the uh, Nanfun Textile Mills, one of the big uh, cotton spinning uh, mills in Hong Kong at that time. Please go to next. So this is the uh, building where um, my uh, art center is housed, uh, so called the uh, Nanfun Textile Mills. And uh, so the uh, Center for Arts and uh, Center for Arts and Textile, uh, Arts and Text, uh, sorry, Chat. So it's a nickname. Center for Heritage Arts and Textile is a part of uh, Hong Kong's industrial um, heritage conservation projects. So therefore, the um, the textile is one of our DNA. And uh, but the Hong Kong actually didn't have the um, craftsmanship. You know, textile industry supported by the craftsmanship. They produce the mundane textiles for daily use, like the sheets and the tablecloths, you know, workers' uniform, those kind of stuff. So please go to next. So this is, I just want to show the, uh, how the, uh, these factories uh, get the uh, big surgery uh, to have the new face. Okay, please go to next. So this is the, uh, um, the, where chat is in-house. Okay, please go to next. Okay, we have the three gallery spaces, and one is dedicated to narrate the Hong Kong textile industry past because, you know, people just forget. And, uh, and, um, but uh, also this industry um, is uh, strongly related to the uh, um, history, historical narrative, the things happening in East Asia. Uh, for instance, in the uh, China after the World War II, when the Communist Party took the uh, uh, China. So many capitalist and um, uh, textile uh, factory workers fled to Hong Kong, then they start up the business in Hong Kong. That was a kind of the beginning of the textile industry. So unfortunately, uh, the textile industry in Hong Kong is over. There's no factory anymore. 
and um, because it's the wage is expensive, then the property is expensive. Um, so, but the um, the chat is uh, set up the one of the um, um, which uh, the companies that original business was at the spinning factory. So they want to kind of hand, uh, passing over the uh, legacy of textile industry to next generations. Okay, please go to next. Yeah, so this is the, uh, what we are doing. Please go to next. Go to next. So, yes, for us, the textile is um, not only about the material, it's subject matters, agencies, uh, to communicate uh, with the contemporary audiences what kind of the programs and the agendas textiles you know, convey to the public. And um, so that's really um, something I find very interesting because it's textile everybody use, you know, in every aspect of our everyday. But the, um, the old problems like, you know, colonial histories, environmental, you know, uh, issues, we, um, you know, easily overlook. So that's something I'm working on to how to, you know, explore the, these kind of the uh, hidden agendas. Uh, through the exhibitions and the workshops, and uh, also that we invite the contemporary artists and designers, how to rediscover um, the textile materials or how to revisit, you know, the uh, history of the textile industry. So that is a fascination part. So do I answer your question? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, but my my question was uh, why we are talking still about textile art uh, with uh, this. Um, Art, uh, textile, yes, not about art, but, but you treated te textile in the uh, context of craft too, too yes? No, mm. it's not only about the, uh, the craft. It's, uh, I think it's a textile is a, um, can be medium, but can mm -hmm. be the, uh, also subject matters. It can be the uh, concepts and also mm -hmm. performabilities. Weaving is action. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is the, uh, my answer. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And hello, good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation, for Marta and for the Academy, and for all of you that is here today. Um, I work for more than two decades as a contemporary art curator, and I never um, work with one specific media. So I was part of the jury, I think, as a way of uh, also opening the perspective. And then I decided to show um, the work of an artist, uh, Ivani Neuschwander, a Brazilian artist, very relevant, uh, that did two years ago an exhibition in New York where she collaborated with people um, uh, working specifically with um, tapestry. So <coughs> I will read... Uh, quickly two paragraphs here just to give information and I felt this um, mm -hmm. could answer the questions or just you know bring because I'm a curator I feel I always talked through the work of artists so I decided to to bring Hivani here so the name of the exhibition is tropics damned orgasmic and devoted and it's a reference to a book of a female Brazilian poet called Hilda Hist a book from 84 um, the exhibition, maybe we can go to the images. So this is the overview, where tapestries are um, put together with paintings and drawings in the gallery. So some information about it is uh, feature, featuring tapestries, painting and drawings, as well as an installation that I will not talk about today. The exhibition explored themes of fear, sexuality, politics and violence. Drawing upon different cultural references, Neuschwander delves into the public and private vulnerabilities that have led to a new wave of nationalism and polarization around the globe. Um, the title of the exhibition, inspired by poet Hilda Hist, precisely reflects the current social political context in Brazil, but could easily apply to most post colonial cultures around the world. So, Tropical, each of the words of the title is like tropical, setting condemned through history as a colony of external power, orgasmic as the role of exotic fantasy is projected, projected upon its people, 
us <laughs> in the case, and devoted throughout history to dubious organized religions and faith movements. So this is also the title of this new series of large-scale tapestries and paintings that are based on the aesthetics of 17th century Japanese erotic woodcuts and also inspired by Cordel, folk literature popular in the Brazilian Northeast region. I think we can see the images so we can go through so people see while I give the information. Um, for Noche van der Fear is fundamental to mapping the different ways in which authoritarian governments come to power and the necropolitics they employ in order to maintain it. Investigating how emotions can be instrumentalized as tools of control and manipulation, the exhibition unveils the mechanism used to perpetuate political dominance. The tapestry's beauty and their skillful craftsmanship emphasize the ambiguity of attraction and repulsion of aesthetics and violence. Um, for the work <coughs> in tapestries, Hivani initiated, I'm sorry, Hivani invited three artists who master a technique developed by a Uruguayan um, tapestry making called Ernesto Arostegui to participate in the project, Elke Hulse, Magali Sanchez Vera, and Jorge Soto. She invited them to transpose the images she created on drawings and paintings into tapestry and to do a personal touch in the red part of each of the tapestry, so in the blood of each painting. So that's the general information. And um, about your question, I do believe artists, I was thinking about uh, a speech by Pina Bausch, um, the the choreographer and creator of um, dance theater where she says she's talking about dance but she say it's not about dance it's about life and it's about creating a language to life and then she said and it's not always art but it can become art <laughs> so i feel artists need to materialize um they are what they bring from other sources into you know materia um and creating different language to use it, and each language will bring a different speed, a different way of relating to the bodies, a different aesthetics, and in this sense, I think it's very important to, to have the different languages available. So, Thank you very much. <laughs> I think that these uh, three answers are very, very interesting and uh, connecting with different fields of uh, textile. <laughs> so maybe my second question. In the most of the, the, the art disciplines, we see a development of crossover to other disciplines of art media. I wonder which, de which developments you see in this way in the fields of art textile. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Marta, can you ask that question again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In the most of the art disciplines, we see a development of crossover to other disciplines of art media. Yes. I wonder which uh, developments you see in this way in the field of art textile. For example, painting, um, architectural, three-dimensional. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Um Again, to, to answer from my own perspective, in Tate Modern Museum, which just to give you context, is the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in London. Um, over the past decade, we've been um, acquiring works, many works by artists um, from all over the world, and we've tried to be much more global in our reach, and we're thinking a lot about the transnational. So we are led more by geographies than by media. So I'm, I'm a bit of a, an exception in my curatorial team, big team of curators, for, for uh, thinking more about media. Um, but we've brought in many works by artists that do exactly what you're describing, where, you know, you, in any case, even if we were sectioned up by media, which we're not, 
Um, I know there are other museums of modern art where you do have a department of sculpture or a department of painting. We've never been this. But even if we were, um, I, I would say that it absolutely no longer makes any sense because the works that we're bringing in, um, like Rivani as, a, as an example, I'm trying to think of... Uh, of course, when you're on the spot, your mind goes completely blank, but there are many, many, many examples <laughs> of artists now who move between different media, who, you know, sometimes will use elements of textile, sometimes film, and they will um, feel free to use whatever medium they wish to express their ideas. Um, well, here's a very big example. We are just opening um, a new commission in the Turbine Hall of works by Cecilia Vicuña, who many of you will know because she just won the big prize, the Golden Lion in Venice. She's an artist who's worked in a very distinct way. Um, for a long time, she she's, uh, has a very advanced career. Um, and she has used elements of textile, things drawn from the environment. Her work is also uh, as a poet um, and a writer. She's also used as performance. She uh, works with communities. So all of these things are encompassed into one practice to express a way of being and a way of existing in the world. And you know, I think, I think that this is so much what artists are about. They're led by um, ideas, by philosophy, by um, ethics, by politics. And, you know, there, there are always people who will specialize in a particular media or go really deep into that. But the, still, the, it has to be also the ideas are in tandem with it. Um, <clears throat> the chat is not the uh, institution based on the collections. We are always inviting the artists to make something. That is exciting part. Um, um, the last two years ago, we had the um, uh, artist, uh, the Taeyun, uh, Choi Taeyun, is a Korean American. Um, he is not textile artist at all. He is the uh, um, media artist working on computer computations, computing. And we invited him to uh, export the how the computer code and the textile um, can, um, can be used for the people's care. And uh, he, you know, he, has, he didn't have, he had, he didn't have ideas about the textile at all, but obviously, you know, the uh, jacquard, uh, the loom is the origin of computer. So there is a common language, it's code, to make the pattern, right? So the, uh, um, he organized a workshop for the, uh, um, the blind people, and um, uh, we developed the, um, the, the textile patterns by, uh, the, through the uh, workshop teaching the, uh, the um, coding, coding workshops. Then the, uh, we translate that coding into the uh, textile patterns and the media tactile artworks. So that is uh, uh, how we worked, you know, with the textile. So um, yeah, so it's uh, always we learned, you know, the the possibility of the textile through the artist's eyes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Um, um I'm thinking that how it's so important to have the techniques and the development, um, the learning of it in the academies, and the research on each technique and each media, as well as um, the ways of preserving them in the museums. So this is so important. And, um, but I'm thinking about this contemporary art that since the 50s and 60s, can, the artists can cross disciplines quite easily. And maybe the, the example of Hivani interests me because she, she collaborates with different people. She always brings life uh, very close uh, to art, but also uh, cra what is considered craft when she brings to contemporary art museums and galleries in New York, like this one, 
and put on the side of her own painting. It's her painting, tapestry. And then she kind of, uh, um, she's interested in, in um, how do you say, erasing these limits as if they are always blurred and they can be thinking uh, differently. So, and I think it's important also that she quotes who are the artists that are part of this collaboration. So they are more, they consider themselves more as craft people, as I understand. So she commissioned the, the pieces and, but then she shows everything in this gallery in New York. And this can somehow uh, create some dislocations in the thinking of the technique, I believe. I don't know. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And uh, the last question, because I think that uh, that we have to be on time. <laughs> uh, what will be the most remarkable developments in the field of art textile in the near future, starting now already to your opinion? <laughs> so, Anne. <laughs> this is not fair. They get more time to think than I do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> hmm the future <laughs> <laughs> i'm a museum curator you shouldn't ask me about the future <laughs> i know about the past <laughs> um i think i mean all all i can say really is that to reiterate what i previously said and i think this is also something that was really coming through or is really coming through in the selection of works for the textile tapestry triennial mm -hmm. um, that I was thinking about yesterday. That it's very apparent that young artists are very politically engaged, that their works are um, reflecting their position in the world and reflecting what it means to be uh, part of, you know, global systems and digital, the digital age and um, everything that is so pertinent to our times, migration and, of course, climate change. And um, all of these threads, these ideas, you know, were coming through in the work that you've pulled together so beautifully and you made these beautiful sections and themes in the show. Um, and I, I, I would hope that this is something that will continue mm -hmm. to be um, the most pertinent aspect of practice as we, as we move forward, that mm -hmm. of course, you know, we, we have to find a way of working with media and material and as Annie Albers would have said, be led by the material. <laughs> um, but I don't think that that is, I don't think that that is a contradiction. I think that artists are able to, 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 to bring these things together so that the material and the ideas and everything is, is um, it's not like one is secondary to the other. And so I think in the future, this will, you know, I think we're going to see more and more that this is the direction of contemporary practice. Yeah, then um, um, working with the uh, young artists and then they uh, strongly <coughs> drive on the uh, um, ethical, you know, motivations, especially, you know, the textiles is infamous, you know, to give the negative impacts on the, uh, you know, uh, the environment. So, um, you know, they are really keen to, um, to know they are where the material is coming from, what kind of environments, you know, the, um, the workers working, and uh, where, the, you know, the, where these kind of the textiles go after the show and et cetera. And, um, uh, also, the many practitioners um, went back to the um, the natural dye, you know, natural resource. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the many artists we are working, they are, uh, do they start farming, 
you know, the bringing up the, all the plants, you know, fibers, you know, the uh, also compose, uh, the composting the, uh, to create the dye. That's, uh, I can see the uh, kind of the futures of the textile art. So we can't, we need to be more uh, responsible yeah. on the materials and uh, where the materials coming from and uh, where it's go. You know, we cannot create the another extra textile waste by making the arts also, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, uh, but you know, apparently textile is also the uh, material and the methodology to connect the uh, peoples, right? So therefore we are here now. So I also can see the, uh, um, the future of the textile in this regard. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was also thinking about the three works that we awarded um, for the triennial because we discussed this a lot, how these artworks can actualize ancestral or traditional techniques into the present. Let's say I don't believe so much or I don't see uh, a line, a historical line, like the future in front as the Western way of seeing. I believe it's uh, all in the present. And once these artworks are there with, um, with a conjunction of um, contemporary ways of speaking and creating language with ancestral um, techniques or ways of, of making art, they are already um, opening space for future somehow. And I felt it was beautiful that we discuss about this artist that uh, were um, somehow actualizing um, the technique into the present. But also, I'm, I, I love what... Um, Mizuki said, because I feel it's difficult in the present not to think about the, all the whole ethics and economical and sustainable um, way of making art uh, yeah. in general. So. I just wanted to say as well that, you know, I made a joke about, I, I only think about the past because <laughs> I'm a museum curator, but it's not really true. I, I, think, I think we also need to really... We need to stop thinking, of course. We need, to re, we need to recalibrate our conceptions of time, you know, the past, the present, the future. These are not things that we can think of anymore as being in a linear sequence or as being separate from each other. And I think this is so much tied up with our material world. And if you start to explore and you look into, like Mizuki so you look into the... Um, origins of fiber and you start to think about what it, it what this material is where it comes from and how it links us back to our ancestral past and its migration across the world and all of that um, these things are so bound up that you start to lose this linearity and it becomes more circular mm -hmm. thank you very much I, I don't know if uh how much time we have, but maybe you, you would like to ask a question. Somebody, yes, have a question for two? The girl? No. <laughs> so thank you so much. I think that it was very, very, very uh, interesting. And um, yes, and um, uh, thank you very much for uh, participating in the jury and uh, for coming. Thank you. <laughs>
about the gender thing. Can I help? Ah, okay. Can follow my English. Yes. We know each other very well. You can cope with me. <laughs> no, but maybe it's I've got more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. no I anyway. Don't, you don't want to impose. No, no. <laughs> I was, the fact thinking, that we are like, I was thinking curatorially. Yeah, and I was just talking about all things. Drink out the bottle. Okay. That works for me. Can they all be in the name? Look, there are too many things I've got to get to. Okay. I've got to get to the Can I have any uh, feedback? Uh, can I start now? Are we ready? Because, yeah, it's it's time. Okay, so welcome uh, at the second session, second panel. It will be about education. Uh, I will um, tell you about our guests. I mean, they will present their uh, short presentation so that you uh, could have the um, bigger picture of what they do, why are they here. And they are all rep representing di different perspectives and views on text creation and teaching on the academic level. And um, what I will ask later is about um, the situation in teaching textiles, because we are uh, here uh, because of textiles, textile art and textile design. And uh, so let's uh, let's start. Um, our first guest, I mean, the <laughs> the one who will start, is um, John Paul Morabito, professor at Kent State University, USA. So, uh, yeah, let's start with the short presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. It's wonderful to be here. Um, Next slide, please. Um, because I'm a bit fussy, I'm just going to read to you all to make sure everything is there. <laughs> um, so I find myself in the strange position of speaking on pedagogy just after transitioning between institutions. So after a decade of teaching at the school of their Institute of Chicago, I left to take on the leadership of the textiles program at Kent State University. And I'm beginning here just to establish some context. Next slide, please. I teach from my position as an artist, but not necessarily from my own art practice. This distinction is extremely important. I want my students to have the freedom and tools to follow their own curiosity, to ask questions that lead them to unexpected places, to develop the ability to be critical of themselves and the world around them, and to grow into artists and cultural workers according to who they are and what they value. It is my hope that they build the foundations of independence. Teaching is itself a form of cultural activism and creative change. I understand this as a social practice where the construction of meaning is engaged through a relational learning community that co-creates knowledge. In this way, my pedagogical work engenders the creation of meaning and cultural change in an entirely different way than my art making, and as such is inextricably bound to my practice as an artist. Next slide, please. In this moment, we are called to reckon with the colonial legacy of the academic discipline of textiles and reorient toward a more inclusive practice. Through my teaching, I work to highlight a longer and more inclusive history in which black and brown folks, indigenous makers, femmes, the queer community, disabled bodies, and others have impacted the development of aesthetics. 
In the studio as classroom, you're developing a material fluency in which allows students to transgress boundaries. As making and meaning are inseparable, reading and discussion happen alongside studio activity. Vocabularies are developed and expanded through the study of complex textile constructions and dye processes, alongside the integration of handwork and digital tools. Through their making, my students engage rigorous conceptual questions in abstraction, figuration, sculptural form, spatial intervention, and performative action. Together, we blur the boundaries between textiles, painting, sculpture, architecture, technology, and language. This work considers the practice of weaving and textiles more broadly as an expansive playground to complicate the paradigms of contemporary art with textility. Next slide, please. I am the assistant professor and head of textiles in the School of Art at Kent State University, a public research one university located 50 kilometers south of Cleveland. As more and more fiber programs are closed, Kent State stands among a small cohort where students can pursue the study of textiles within the context of a publicly funded research university. My predecessor, Janice Lesman Moss, began her tenure in 1981 and led the program for 40 years. Under her leadership, Kent built a robust weaving area and was one of the first programs in the United States to develop a jacquard curriculum. Jacquard weaving continues to be one of the central components of the program. You can see the work of Professor Lesman Moss in the Mentors exhibition, along with work by our MFA in textiles alumni, Megan Smith and Diana Pemberton in the YTAT exhibition. Next slide, please. Kent State University offers coursework in weaving, off-loom pursuits, felt making, dye and print. Our program is distinguished by a rigorous weaving curriculum structured horizontally to, uh, to support entry into weaving topics courses that are focused on conceptual and formal questions in color, imagery, abstraction, complex drafting, and dimensionality. This is expanded with an emphasis on transdisciplinarity and pollinary approaches that push weaving and textiles beyond the binary. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, John Paul. Um, the next speaker is Timper Williams, Professor of Arts Textile in Bergen, Norway. So, yes, let's Good start. Good afternoon. Thank you also for uh, welcoming me to uh, be part of the uh, esteemed panel. Uh, I'm going to actually say some very similar things to Jean-Paul, but uh, a little bit more off-piste and talk to the pitches. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say why I think I'm on the sofa. Um, and all of us here do many things in the work we do, but I am first and foremost a weaver. I'm a weaver of materials, I'm a weaver of stuff, but I'm a weaver of people, a weaver of ideas, a weaver of systems in an education, etc. Primarily, my life is uh, very much run by my role as an educator, but I'm doing many, many things. And uh, all these images here represent the things I've done over many years that qualify me as a weaver, but I also think qualify me as an educator, what I have to share with others, what I know that I know that might be of use to others. My task as an educator, I believe, is to facilitate others' visions. I have skills, I have knowledge, they're mine, but they have a value to others, and that's what I try to do. Next slide. So this is the environment I'm in now. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, perhaps, I'm from England, but I moved to Norway three years ago to take up professorship. Uh, the building on the right is a, a Snorheta piece of work by the, the architect Snorheta. It's like a spaceship that's landed in part of Bergen and it represents the core building of one of seven faculties. There's 18,000 students at the University of Bergen, about 700 in the uh, in Coem there, the, the arts, music, design faculty. And art is within that. These images represent the studio environment, which will be very familiar to you. It's very comprehensive, but I would say uh, modest in scale. And it's an environment where we can empower uh, creative minds, uh, creative hands and hearts to, to move forward with their own visions. Next slide. Uh, so education uh, in our context is, Kunst in, in Bergen is not, I don't have a community of students that are coming to me, coming to us just to do textiles, they're doing many things. I have very small moments with students. I'm very conscious of that. What can I do in this small period of time? We've just had an introduction period of three weeks. 
incredibly valuable. What seeds can I sow? What seeds can we sow? And it's about fundaments. It's about the skills to, uh, to be able to work autonomously in that workshop environment with others. I strongly believe in the importance of herd knowledge. You can't learn everything yourself, but as a group, you actually cover a lot of ground. And you can see from the uh, image on the right, for example, I'm working with students here uh, on how to create uh, uh, patterns. And we all know, I've noticed a lot of people yesterday wearing the hound's tooth. It's, it's a pattern and it, it comes from a code, but it's also loaded culturally. So it's a combination of technique and cultural, cultural context. Again, skilling people to work with their visions. So they're, they're the artists to be, they're the artists of the future. My task, our task is to build those minds. Next slide. An activation of that skill set. Something we work on very hard is uh, the presence of the students and their work uh, in the public domain. The public is their, is their main audience, their main critic. And we work uh, particularly with a local museum to give a regular uh, platform for the textile artists from the art community. We bring, I bring, you can see a, we had a visiting professor from Japan in the spring, uh, so the students had a chance to learn about katazome technique, and again a small exhibition, lectures, uh, building the skills, again autonomous practice, and the images in the middle, on, middle there show literally taking the students out into the city to activate the contextual side of their work. Uh, this was a, a text workshop working with master's students to have them really connecting with even the key words, what are the fundamentals of their practice so they can start to articulate beyond the objects that are hanging on the wall. I think that's it. Thank you. Um, so now uh, let's go to Janice, please. <laughs> Better? Okay. Dziękujemy bardzo. Bardzo się przepraszam, że mówić bardzo mało po polsku, so I'll speak in English if I may. Um, because my Polish is 46 years old. Um, thank you very much to everyone, to Marta and Aneta and everyone in the academy. I want to be very brief, um, if I can. I spent 43 years in university art school higher education. I went to the art schools in the late 60s in London and the UK, so that means I am a baby boomer, a generational activist, where we decided in the painting school where I was based to break down boundaries. So we started video performance. I was taught so by very interesting artists, uh, and there was no difference between painting and sculpture. This is my great friend and my mentor, uh, Sarat Maharaj, who first got me into Goldsmiths uh, to really work in the art history department to stir up art history, which eventually became visual cultures. But before, and this is his uh, text tale telling a protein enzyme, because as he knows, and as I know, we've had a commitment to cloth and stuff in all its various forms for the last 40 plus years. Um, and you can see it's very furry, it's edgy, it moves around. We don't have any sense of being uh, contained or held back. But when I finished my painting degree, um, which was in the early 70s, I went to work with somebody called Tadik Boyklik, who was out of the uh, Poznan. Uh, he didn't stay for very long. He went to warmer climes, Spain, I, I think. Uh, but that's when I first saw that my constructions in painting, which were very uh, false, I thought, could be part of a different kind of structuralist aesthetic. Uh, so from there, as many people know, uh, I went to work with Abba Kanovitz in uh, Poznan, but there was Urs or Ursula Plefka Schmidt and, and Anna Bonarchuk also. And the point there was in structuralism, you built from inside out and not outside in. So I have major influences. One is obviously that area, and the other is my long-term critique of histories of Western modernism. And you'll see if I move on to the next slide. I could read you some of the most brilliant things Sarat has ever written, but I won't. This is my girl talk, what I call 1995. I, I managed to find this. Uh, it's called Fiber Art, Met Minimalism in a Garage. 
and it's Dexian shelving, which as you can see is from the everyday stuff of sisal, dyed a vibrant pink. And when I exhibited this, I took on a male pseudonym uh, because I knew at the time, uh, even in 95, there wasn't such an open generosity as there is now to playing with gender and identity. So if I, I had a male pseudonym, it was more possible to make an entry into what you might call the commercial gallery scene. I didn't stay for long, it wasn't my particular interest. Next slide, please. And of course, the other great uh, question would be that of identity. And what are the socio, uh, I said this was, there was two areas, two paradoxes. One is this critique of modernism and minimalism, and the second is really how, what is the politics of representation? and the representation of politics. And if you start in painting, the question of the image is very paramount. So this is my Kosovo bundles. Uh, this is digitally printed. And I did a whole series at the time of thinking about what that representation might be, specific to place, to issue, but also the potential to carry perhaps something which we all are aware of, particularly now. So if it's universal, it's because there's always war, there's always migration, there's always pain, and there's always suffering. Next slide, please. Uh, just very quickly to show you, when I went to Goldsmiths and I moved from the art history into setting up and running the textile area, it was adjacent to fine art, so it was called visual arts, and the movement across. This is Ruth McDougall, this is the MA I set up. This is her spouting out of stuff in paper. And this is from 94. Next slide, please. This is a performative piece, electric performance with knitting from a, a young undergraduate student. And if you move around on that particular uh, surface uh, with the knit, you generate electricity of some kind. Next slide, please. Uh, Lucy, who was here in the last uh, Triennale, uh, a bit of a skirt, she was one of our BA students. And if people ask, well, what do the students do afterwards? A whole variety of things, they make work, they continue, they could be poor, they might be picked up. Ruth, for example, is a gallery curator in Brisbane in Australia. She continues with her own practice, people become writers. They do a whole diversity of things within the expanded field of what these practices signify. Next slide, please. And I just want to say that because I come from England and we have a history of colonialism and empire, I have been also greatly supported, apart from my American colleagues, what I call the generation of black British artists, uh, Yinka Shonabari, who did do fine art at Goldsmiths, and of course the love of material surfaces and the signification of migration is evident because you can use those facilities with technical support. Uh, so this is his rather wonderful piece uh, where he's criticising the Grand Tour, headless of course, always the mannequins are headless if they're Western, uh, in the Venice Biennale in 2002. Next slide, please. And I curated a show called Boys Who Sew. I did want the slang, Boys Watch Sew, but that was uh, not proper in England, so I had to call it Boys Who Sew in 2004. And this is another great mate, Hugh Locke. Um, whose yardy dolls and critique of colonial endeavours is very profound. And I think the next slide might be his very truly magnificent final procession at the commission at Tate Britain, where it might look like the Day of the Dead, it might look it's having a good time, but it's actually a critique of English colonialism. And, you know, in these exchanges, this is what I think students are very conscious of and aware of. Uh, to do with multiple identities and sensitivities, and they're also very politically charged. Next slide, please. And this is just a detail of something that runs for meters and meters, and it is in relation to how the English exploited the Ghanaian uh, production with different kinds of printing and cloth and construction. And the final slide, please, uh, partly because I did nip off to Venice, and who wouldn't? Um, it's very odd to have this from Ghana, uh, Ministry of Gender, Labour and Social Development, when we know there are big problems in Ghana. But I think Jessica, because Jessica's here, knows uh, Karuna's work. What I really liked about the Ugandan pavilion, there is materiality, there is bark cloth, there is painting, and there's community developed 
uh, basketry work. And it's all in conversation, in dialogue, and that's the most important, the dialogic, a dialogic exchange. It's neither one thing or another. It is in its constant exchange. Last slide, please, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janice. And now, uh, Lala de Dios, Spanish-born lecturer and curator of international textile craft, art and design events in Spain. <laughs> thank you, Dominica. <It's coughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you to the organizers. It is always a honor to talk after Janice, and it's also a challenge, I hope. <laughs> well, I am an art, art historian by training and a weaver, a vocational weaver. My professional practice as a weaver and teacher spans over more than 40 years. I have always taught hand weaving, dyeing, and spinning techniques in my private studio located in downtown Madrid for most of that period. Later, I moved to a small village near Madrid. In the 80s, so I'm talking about uh, non-institutional education and introducing a different field. Uh, in the 80s, textile crafts were hugely popular, and most of my students were women. Housewives came in the morning, professional women in the afternoon. During the last 20 years or so, the profile of my students has changed. They are still mostly women, but now they are younger and have a training background, or they work in creative professions. <coughs> they may be illustrators, graphic designers, fashion designers, architects, or they come from fine art academies. All of them feel attracted. Can you? Oh, you can change, please. All of them feel attracted to the creative potential of textiles. There are many visual artists in Spain interested in textiles, and they mostly use knitting, stitching, crochet. That is techniques that can be learned easily and do not require a complex training or complex equipment. And why? because textile art and design are not taught in fine art academies in Spain. In fact, textile techniques are only taught in some few art schools in the, the whole country. So you see, we have a problem. From the beginning, uh, to my students, coming back to my students, from the beginning, I make clear to them they are not learning a hobby. They are learning the most ancient craft and skills invented by humanity a craft that has a long and manifold history, but has always been a motor for innovation, from the invention of the silk loom, the jacquard loom, to synthetic dyes and fibers, and to current research about biomater biomaterials. I try to give my students an immersive experience in what it means a professional textile practice. You can change it. And in what it means a professional textile practice as a maker, a designer, or an artist. I do this by sharing with my students information about all kinds of textile events or developments, commenting on textile magazines, organizing guided tours to museums, exhibitions, and so on. In 2020, we came to this city to visit the Triennial in, the, in this academy. So my goal is not only to broaden their vision, but also to look at the styles with an open mind and to encourage individuality. I also teach master classes on textile, top, you can change, on textile topics uh, in a number of art and design schools, fat labs, and lately museums. Out of Spain, I am usually asked to lecture about Spanish textile art and design. When Spain, I have also another kind of experience in teaching, because when Spain joined the European Union, we, th we had access to European projects and European money. And I took part in quite a few projects, teaching in remote rural areas in my country, where the lack of jobs made people live for the big cities. And the government politics wanted to, they wanted to fix the population. Uh, I have also worked in cooperation for development projects in African and South American countries. And that, I must say, that has, this has greatly enriched my vision of textile practice in the world today. And, also, and has also enriched my personal understanding of people in life. And I consider myself very lucky to have been given the chance to live 
these experiences. And this is all. Thank you very much. So um, I will also explain myself uh, why I'm here asking uh, questions to those magnificent uh, panelists. Um, because I didn't present myself. I'm Dominika krogulska czekalska and I'm teaching here at the Academy. I'm a lecturer, so uh, my perspective is also uh, important here while asking questions. And the first question is um, um, strongly connected with uh, the situation at our Academy where we have um, uh, specializations and this narrowing. And I was wondering, uh, what do you think about it? If this narrowing specialization uh, help? And if you have any ex examples of uh, to, to, to share, um, yeah, I would be grateful. Does it in Art Academy, uh, is it a uh, um, proper uh, attitude? Can I, can I add to your question? Are you asking specialism in terms of textiles within an, a wider art design field, or are you talking about specialism within textiles? Uh, both, I would say. I think this is a tricky question to think through. Um, because on the one hand, uh, specialization gives you access to a discipline, which gives you access to a methodology of thinking and an understanding of materials and how they behave, but it also closes you off from conversations with other people, potentially. And so uh, one of the things that I find important in my own teaching and my own work as an artist is to find a way to be both specialized and broad at the same time. Um, so in my classroom, I throw around the word transdisciplinarity as an alternative to interdisciplinarity to talk about the way in which weaving, um, and it's not unique to weaving, but to think about weaving as a practice that can encompass conversations that are more broad than itself. So to think about the conversation with painting through weaving, a conversation with sculpture through weaving, um, it, it enables you to get beyond just the, it allows you to be both specific and broad at the same time. And I think it's very important, especially in this moment, that we encourage our students to get beyond their specializations, to have conversations with people outside of their discipline. And um, in order to do that, we, we have to encourage the broadness. So. Thank you. Uh, does any of you have something to add? Um. I'll say something because I think uh, I had one very great and distinct advantage. I spent uh, 30 years at Goldsmiths, which is in the University of London. And Goldsmiths had 14 departments, and I had the opportunity to work right across them. It might be to do with weaving or textiles as metaphor or activism, but um, I think I would still use the term interdisciplinary. Uh, and I did most of my work with anthropologists, sociologists, and even with musicians. And that was broadening out not only my skill set, but also those uh, I could partner with and collaborate with. I mean, it's a very lonely life just working in a studio, talking to yourself. Um, and being perhaps much more of a social person, <laughs> to be out and doing things in a very marvellously brilliant set of people and communities that occupied itself in the University of London. And also because I had worked abroad, um, the last 20 years I worked mostly with Barbara Lane, who some of you will know, in Concordia, and we had five big research projects around textiles technology. And that also enabled me to eventually work in a computing department. Now, people think, why on earth would you do that? Well, actually, sometimes the art facility can be terribly narrow. And so moving into computing and moving it from maths and statistics enabled one to set up all the arts and technology programs and the digital studios. So again, that was another interdisciplinary activity. And because the UK is obsessed with employability, and we've discussed this, those skill sets meant you could move from material 
practices into the coding programming, and I still think coding is a material practice, to enable them to have different possibilities as entering, if you like, setting up their own ways of working and employability or else being employed in what was, in London at least, a very thriving creative industry sector. Lala, would you like to add something? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree with everything they have said. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I have a comment on specialism. Um, and the reason I asked my question is because I, I think the, the focus areas, if I can use that expression, within textiles are differently nuanced. And as a, as a weaver who's also had a, my own bachelor first year experience was 50% weave and 50% print. And I'm incredibly grateful to myself for giving myself that experience because I can actually go into the print studios and teach print quite well. It was a very good education. But I believe, especially having um, dipped my fingers into industrial design in Japan some years later, that I was very qualified for that environment because of the depth of knowledge I acquired by having a specialist education. But I also think it's given me the capacity to enter into other areas, to understand the depth of a, of, a, of a way of working and following something through. I think I like what Janice is saying there about this kind of, it's an overused term, but transferable skills. I think a specialist education is a very qualifying thing to enable you to understand how to follow something through from the beginning, the building up, the creation, the different questions you need to ask to get to the end point. So personally, I feel strongly that a specialist education is a, a great way into something much more diverse later. And I do struggle, I have to say, with, if I can be very direct, if we take the two key art academies in, in Norway where textiles is offered, my colleagues in Oslo are dealing with a community which is essentially fixed in textiles. In Bergen, it's much more of a butterfly environment. The students are traveling around. And that's why I said just now, those moments when we have the students are so precious. Because if they come back later and they don't have the tool set, they're going to struggle. So there's, it's, it's, it's about time. So that's a long answer to the question. But it's essentially about the value of specialism being a doorway to, like you say, John Paul, other things. Uh, okay, thank you. So, uh, may I say that, uh, yeah, we can start with a material and then still consider art and uh, design teaching as a whole. Uh, do, we, do we agree uh, about it? I, uh, th that's what I uh, understood, that, uh, yeah, it's, it's generally a um, good strategy to, to start with the material specialization and then uh, uh, developing and diversing uh, to, to sum up uh, uh, what you what you said that uh, yeah and uh, yeah, to be more maybe specific uh, what can be the best strategy uh, for our times um, is art and the design rooted in technical skills, craftsmanship, and mastering the matter? Or is this cosa mentale, what uh, Leonardo uh, said, actually? I know that you partly answered um, also this question, but yeah, to, to, to think more about the uh, future, not, not, not just uh, the situation right now, but the future. Do you think that uh, thinking about the future is the right uh, direction? Shall I have a go? I'll have a go and be very brief, because fortunately we had the questions in advance, so I could write something down without being too long-winded. Um, Art education in the UK is in a complete and utter mess, um, partly because of funding, partly because of Brexit, uh, the unmentionable word, but basically the university sector is research driven. It's big grants for big times for big production. It's no wonder that uh, our lovely Tracy Eman set up her own independent art school, uh, which is 
privately funded so that there would be some sense of art education left. And I think that's, that goes back to the 18th century, so it's a real perverse reversal. But if I think about art and design, I, I want a whole area of interdisciplinary education, which includes musicians and drama and performance. And I think that's one of the things when Goldsmiths worked at its best, that's what it did. Um, hybrid forms, potent with the ideas, it could be biographical, we always started with idea first. Uh, elasticities, I call it, of method, meaning and making. And I think, you know, the great privilege of being in London was it was multicultural, diverse, when you could come from Europe easily, it was a big draw. So the internationalization and what that difference offered was quite special and quite extraordinary. How long it can last in these times, I'm a little pessimistic. Well, I don't know uh, if I am answering this question or the previous one, but anyway. <laughs> they are similar. <laughs> oh, sorry. I believe that techniques must be taught first, and then so the designers or artists have the tools to express themselves. Of course, there is a danger of, of specialization and not looking around. But I think that for a, for a creative people, a create, uh, an open mind is essential. It's essential for everybody, but for creative professions, it's a must. That's what I think. And then I believe in collaboration. I think. Uh, I, last week in Spain, I, I attended a seminar in a fine art school in a city, and there were six artists, textile artists, not textile artists, artists that they were using textiles. And there were people, artists from my generation and younger people, around 30 or so. And it was funny because the older artists, all, all of them follow the, the traditional idea of the artists working alone in the studios. But the younger artists all work in teams, uh, working with even computer uh, engineer, you know, uh, working with other disciplines, completely different, because they need it for their projects. So I, I found very interesting that. Uh, and so, I, I just want to add to uh, to this point that um, as we're teaching technique. And as we're teaching material, it is deeply important that we engage with the political and the social context of everything. Um, these methodologies come from someplace. These materials come from someplace. And there has been a history within the teaching of textiles that has ignored where these methodologies are coming from. You know, Ani Albers and weaving, all of that is coming out of uh, pre-Columbian textile cultures that were destroyed through a genocide. And so we, as contemporary weavers trained through the modernist lineage, are carrying on genocidal knowledge. That is something that we need to teach our students as we are teaching them how to interlace threads. You know, and it is a demand that the students have when they come into the classroom, that we recognize their raciality, we recognize their gender, we recognize their socioeconomic positioning. That is as essential as teaching them how to interlace two threads together. Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> um, I, it's a good point you make. I, I remember realizing the importance when I used to teach in Bath in England of reminding the students that had gathered in Bath, they were standing in this Georgian city which was essentially built on slave money. Uh, and we were working with textiles that was, you know, the subject of slavery. And, and the students were quite shocked that I brought this to the discussion, but it had to be said. We're going to do this for four weeks, but before we do, welcome to Bath. <laughs> There's a history here. People of Bath would be mortified, I say this, but it's the truth. But going back to the disciplines again, um, I think... I think there's a, your question about technicalities, I think the thing for me as a weaver again that's important is recognizing the integrity of that discipline within the discipline. So for example, we can all look at the Triennale pieces and we see, for example, colors in front of us that are a manifestation of a combination of warp and weft, for example, or a material. That's important to remember. There's a, there's a specific vocabulary, a specific characteristic which is unique to that language. And I would always want to defend the value of that discipline 
which relies on these fundaments of technical sort of out the basis. But I completely agree that we're thankfully we're in a place of you know post-colonial perspectives, and it's bringing those things to that meeting point as well as those technicalities. Yes, thank you. And as far as I remember, textiles and text has the same uh, root. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and we have so many uh, analogies. You can explain words using the uh, language, the vocabulary connected with uh, textile, yeah. Uh, so, um, again, I feel that I know uh, a bit the answer to my question, but uh, I, I will ask it so that I could share, uh, share it with uh, the audience because yeah, the next question is about strategies because I assume that this is uh, maybe even more important beyond the, the medium uh, and so shouldn't we teach strategies uh, and using creative elastic mind, I took this elastic mind from uh, Paula Antonelli from uh, uh, MoMA, New York, design uh, curator. And so this uh, elastic mind and um, just as a way to survive in uncertain times. And um, yeah, maybe I will be um, a bit provocative right now, <laughs> but does this quite traditional uh, method of teaching in, in art academies, which is so strong and appreciated help and I mean what I mean as this uh, method is um, this comfortable status quo to stay master to your apprentice a student does it still work or what should we do to stay a master and still um, fit into uh, our times it was quite I, I might start with that. Um, I didn't have time in my introduction, but one of the things in my own uh, programming is I did my master's degree in Okinawa in the south of Japan. And some of you in the room will know that uh, teacher in Japanese is sensei, which literally means previous life experience. And when you learn in, in, in Japan, and actually more generally, in, if I can use the expression Far East, it's, there's some common um, ideas that this knowledge that somebody has several years ahead of you, several decades ahead of you, uh, has a kind of higher form. It's, it's longer, it's deeper, it's wider. Uh, another uh, experience I had um, in a different life in Japan was working in a geisha tea house. <laughs> and that's a whole story, but there's an there's a, there's a expression, minarai, which means to see and become. And again, it's about the importance of observing and not necessarily copying, but learning from that previous life experience. So I, I, I struggle with this kind of hierarchical uh, model of the, the, the great uh, master. We've, we currently have an exhibition in our foyer gallery space in the building you just saw, which is called The Professor. And at the opening t uh, session, the curator was talking about this patriarchal pointy finger mm -hmm. and uh, I actually felt quite affronted uh, by that in the moment because I feel I'm an open generous flexible uh, professor but taking another part of your question this elasticity again it's about uh, qualifying students with an ability to be I think resilience is a term I would want to push out there giving again students a tool set uh, capacity to be nimble, to be able to navigate, to be able to change direction. And again, there is a value in that kind of specialist education, but understanding how to, how to be what they want to be um, in a confident way, to learn to work with others, uh, to respect maybe a traditional form of knowledge uh, transfer, but also to uh, embrace it and uh, to, to, be, um, to become independent. Uh, to, to be uh, able to find their own ground. Thank you. No, I, 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 I make a, one observation, if I may, this nimble flexibility. And I think you have to learn to strategize. I mean, my idea of strategy from the late 60s, 70s, politically, is rather different to now. I mean, 
you still have to do it, but you have many more medias and social activities, and, no, not social activities, I love thinking of the Geisha house, actually. Uh, but you have social media, you have platforms, so whatever was a vertical structure is much more horizontal. And, and that, you still have to learn to navigate and negotiate, and you still perhaps have to still engage physically with people to really get to grips and understand the complexities of, of where we are and how we develop those strategies. So I think all of that, and it's not something perhaps institutions with walls have been very good at in the past. And I think one of the jobs that one tried to do was to break it down. So for example, one wrote the student handbooks with the students. That was a collaboration. So they understood, they always had a voice and they could always put that voice in. They weren't always in their first language, so we had to have different... It caused a lot of problems institutionally, but that's the only way you can open up because that's already a strategy. So I think it's important to recognize, and, and I'm responding particularly to the point about the idea of um, the master within a classroom. I think it's really important to recognize that a classroom is made up of a learning community and a learning community co-creates knowledge. Right. Um, so while as the professor, I may be there based on certain experiences that I have, um, there are students in the room that have experiences that I can learn from as well. And we then collectively um, build a knowledge together that drives the field forward into the future. I think as an, as an educator, I'm actually able to touch the future through my students. They keep me relevant. I have to maintain an understanding of what's going on in the world because of their interest, of their positionalities. And that, um, that idea of the, you know, the vertical structure of I am I'm passing knowledge on to you as an empty vessel, like that, that is a thing that needs to go away. <laughs> to be blunt. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm really um, excited with what you, what, you, what you say. I totally agree. And, um, but yeah, I must say that uh, it's still present. My questions are not um, just maybe to you, but also to, to, to others. Uh, but uh, you are here, your, your, your voice is quite strong, so I wanted uh, you to, to use it here to, to spread the news <laughs> and uh, your, your point of view. So, um, yeah, um, I know that there is this stra st strategy, especially in arts, to isolate students from uh, what's happening outside, from all the problems just to stay in the studio and uh, um, feel deeply what you have in, inside and uh, then create to, you know, lift your ego. And um, yeah, does it still uh, work in this world? Is this ethical just to, you know, to, to have this um, strategy? What do you think? No. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if I'd have taken that approach at Goldsmiths, I would have been thrown out. The students would have thrown me out, quite rightly so. Um, and that's, that's really what we're talking about. I mean, I think my job was always to learn, to facilitate, to enable, and to help network. I hope I haven't given an impression I'm talking about no, exercising a pointy finger no, because no, I'm, you're not, not. No, I'm not. I'm not. But I am saying. <laughs> had this conversation yesterday about the use of language and I'm working in Norway and still building Norwegian and I don't have enough Norwegian to be able to teach, to be able to share my knowledge, so I have to use English. So by default, with some of my student community, I'm, I'm sort of stepping above them. I don't mean to, but I can't share with them otherwise. But uh, in terms of strategy, I think I need to think of it more in terms of my task as in, in Norwegian, we use the term emna and svari, which is a module leader. Okay. So it's somebody who's mapping. It's like my job is to set the direction of travel, okay. if I can use that expression. It's a road. It, it has a beginning and an end. But maybe the students want to find a completely different way. They, they have to finish on that date. 
but they can go in many, many different directions. Uh, along the way, they might fall down somewhere, they, they're going to need some, a shine of a light in the corner. So it's a, it is a guiding hand, not a pointy finger. Yes. It's, a, it's about directional travel, it's about facilitation and building as soon as possible an autonomous capacity in the student. I'm so thrilled that the students I was working with just five, six weeks ago who knew nothing about weaving are backstrap weaving, floor loom weaving, TC weaving. I mean, we did a lot in three weeks between three of us. Um, and it was absolutely, like you say, working together. And like I said earlier, herd knowledge. So I believe you're asking a bit about um, the artist in isolation, um, right? And so, so working in a, in a sort of internal capacity. And I, I would not advocate for the artist not being uh, isolated in their studio, if that is what they wish, but there is a social and political context in which you are working. And at least within the climate in the United States academies, if we are not teaching to that, if we are not recognizing the identities of our students within the content that we are teaching and, and encouraging them to find a voice through those experiences, we should not be, we should not be there and many of us would not keep our jobs. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's uh, at this point in time, it's deeply important to teach students how to see the relevance of their work in relationship to the world beyond them. You know, how are, how are they in a conversation with the time that they are living in, with what came before them and what is coming after them? I would like to think, uh, to ask maybe the, the environment where the students live and work. For example, Bergen. I have been in Bergen. It's a very nice, beautiful city, small and quiet. As more or less Norway, but London is different. Yeah. So, I mean, students in, in London receive a very different kind of stimulus that they can receive in Bergen, even in this global village where we live. So, I think that makes a difference in the way you had to teach or you had to guide or something like that. In any one in any one day, you'd hear 60 different languages, and that makes a very very particular difference to your ways of working as one amongst many, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people. But can I just say something very, because I know Tim wants to talk. Y you have to remember for the last 25 years, I've also been a writer. And that's because one of the things we, we did was to always have the thinking, writing, doing within the studio environment or even within the computing environment. Trying to get them to talk was you know, quite hard. But there was a, a generation, I mean, Anne mentioned Griselda Pollock, and it's a very important thing we learned at the end of the 60s, 70s. You had to make, and you had to write, and you had to curate. You had to do all of those things to get things visible. So probably where I've spent my energies that time is writing and collaborating with younger students or younger people to get them published. Because if it's not down, it disappears in another way into the archives of history. So that's been a very important strategy for me. Yeah. That's enough. I'm not going to say uh, that. Yeah, so thank you. I think that we are, uh, we have to come to the, to the end. So to sum up, I will just move to, um, to what you said, which was, I was really thrilled about it, um, about you saying um, about this energy flowing uh, in two directions from students also yes I confirm I uh, they teach me uh, so much they help me uh, find our, myself in this uh, new technological reality and not only this and I also have this my my, my six, 16 years old old uh, daughter I uh, I talked with uh, her about uh, the whole situation today and um, uh, I asked her all those questions because it's, it's really interesting for me what she thinks. And uh, she said when I uh, asked, um, is it our privilege here at the Academy not to worry and just contemplate beauty? She said, this was the one question that she said, ironically, smiling, uh, I know the answer. <laughs> So maybe um, this is a nice uh, 
finish to our uh, panel. Thank you very much. It was an honor to be here as a representative of the Academy. I hope uh, I made it. I'm sitting on the very special armchair by uh, um, Professor Modzelewski, uh, so it's really an honor. It, I think it came from our rector's uh, office. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I hope it was uh, not, not only okay. But, uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, we, we have to now go to another uh, panel, which will be uh, also interesting. So, uh, let's uh, switch the places. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, she just, uh, my daughter, Jan Janice is asking about the answer. Uh, she just smiled and said, smiled. yeah, d I, I think I know the answer. And okay. it was what, what uh, uh, Jean Paul said. Okay. No, no, we cannot just That's sit right. <laughs> and content, only contemplate beauty. Of course, it's important, but yeah, you have to be active, especially if you feel that something is wrong. So thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jakub Gawkowski. It's a great pleasure to um, have this conversation between three of us. And uh, let me introduce my two speakers, um, my two dear guests. Um, so, Nif Coglan, the director of the Richard Sultan Gallery, where she has been working for the past 10 years. Um, with the academic background in art history, but also uh, film studies. Um, she is also um, a writer and contributor to uh, exhibition catalogues. Um, Konstanty Szydłowski of the Szydłowski Gallery, where he has been a director and curator since 2017, um, with academic background, interestingly, in the philosophy. Um, he's also a publisher of the monographic publications books related to the artists of the gallery. And today we are about to discuss the connections between the art market and the textile art, or the art markets maybe, if I can use the, the plural term, because we're speaking here maybe about the, the local market and then the international art market, or the, 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 the many art markets in between the two. Um, so I would ask two of you to maybe briefly introduce the um, the galleries, the institutions, the, the, the work you do, and then we would proceed to the, um, to the questions maybe more 
um, specific things that, that are related to the subject of our conversation. So can we start with the slides, please? Um, should we start from... Okay, then we start with Nif. Thank you. Is this Is that good? Yeah. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for having me here today. It's a, it's a real honor to be here. My first time in Poland, which is slightly embarrassing as we do work with the estate of Polish artists uh, as well as living ones. Um, yes, so I've been working with Richard Saltoon Gallery, who is based in London for the last 10 years. We also just recently opened a space in Rome. One of our key specialties is looking at artists from the 1960s onwards who have been under-recognized or undervalued. And I'll sort of lead into why that's then obviously had a knock-on effect in terms of looking at textile artists, specifically female textile artists. So I just wanted to start by looking at the estate of one of the artists that we work with, which is Barbara Levitus Viderska. And we've worked with the estate for the last two years, so not very long at all. And this, the image that I'm showing is from a work from the 80s called Blurry Space, which is the first time we ever showed her work at the gallery. And it's an incredible work, and the reception to it on the commercial side, if I may be so blunt, was amazing. Uh, so many collectors, I mean, we could have sold this work 30 times over. It just shows the power of her work coming out of Poland, the same generation as Magdalena Abakanovic as well. So I'm just going to quickly whip you through a couple of slides just showing installations at the gallery that have featured textile artists. The one that's on the screen now is featuring three works by Jagoda Bujic, the Croatian-born uh, artist who is still alive. Uh, now in her late 80s, early 90s, and she studied theatre and stage set design, and so a lot of her work has this very sort of volumetric uh, takeover of space, which I think you can see here, specifically on the two works, the one on the left and then the one hanging. And another artist that we work with, though we don't represent the estate, uh, but we do work with on the secondary market, is another local Polish artist, Jolanta Widzka. And I'm showing this image not because it has anything to do with our gallery. It's another gallery in London, Waddington Cousteau. But I wanted to briefly show it to sort of touch on, which I'm sure we'll explore later, the changing focus of the commercial art world in terms of looking at artists who work with fiber. Waddington Cousteau has not necessarily historically shown textile artists. And this is an exhibition they did last year in October, November, so during Freeze, which is the hot prime spot uh, for a commercial gallery in London. And it featured several artists, as well as Barbara Levitus Federska, Francois Grossin, Olga de Amaral, as well as some female sculpture artists. This is a work by Barbara called Fire. And then this, Again, which I'm sure we'll lead into, a work featuring on the right Jagoda Bujic. And this is an installation image from the recent touring exhibition from the Centre Pompidou, uh, Women in Abstraction, which then toured to the Guggenheim Bilbao. And again, it's, this, it's the idea of looking at institutions which are refocusing, whether it's someone like MoMA, who in their rehang did an entire section based around textile arts. MoMA has a huge history, you know, starting from the 1969 wall hanging show. But I think in the 80s and 90s, with that refocus on painting, female fiber artists sort of fell by the wayside, were forgotten about in a sense. But it, there was a resurgence in the 2000s following exhibitions like WAC at MoCA and Els at Centre Pompidou, where institutions started looking at that generation in a new way. Uh, the MFA Boston, the ICA Boston, also significantly doing exhibitions around that. And then most recently, an exhibition from the Kessner Gesellschaft, which is just closed, which, touching on what we were discussing earlier, this idea of fiber art, look, looking at fiber art in a fine art context and forgetting about the media, thinking about it as just within contemporary art. And I think that exhibition that Adam Budak did was really successful at that. He really incorporated 
a wide diverse range of media and artists in a new way that took away the media as the focus and just looked at it as fine art, as contemporary art. And then I'm just showing this again to talk about the art market when we get there. It's a installation image from a recent exhibition that we did in Chicago at Expo Chicago, one of the art fairs there, and dedicated entirely to female fiber artists. So showing everyone from Luba Kredci, the Czech uh, artist who used the traditional lace and bobbin techniques, to Barbara Levitus Vederska, to Magdalena Bakunovic, to more contemporary artists like the British born Sue Richardson. And I wanted to show it because I wanted to, to touch on this idea of the way that collectors are responding to it, not necessarily institutions who have always been ahead of the game in that sense. But I think the way that collectors are now pivoting in terms of approaching the media is really important. And I think, I hope we will touch upon that. So yeah, this is it. Can we have the uh, other slides, please? Oh, it's us. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, very happy to be here and very glad. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I represent Galeria Shudłowski, Shudłowski Gallery, which was founded uh, by my father. So I'm second generation of the gallery. Um, in 96 and um, my father starting the gallery he mainly created a program that was based on uh, Polish post-war classics uh, such as um, Wojciech Fangor, Owicka, Jolanta which was already mentioned by my colleague and uh, Erna Rosenstein as well as uh, artists uh, like Koji Kamoji uh, who might be, uh, you might be familiar with, uh, even though it's a Japanese artist, he lives in Poland from late 50s, so it makes him uh, <laughs> almost a Polish artist, definitely a part of Polish art history. Uh, so it's been five years that I'm um, managing the gallery and um, constructing the program, and uh, my main focus was to make a connection between what was historically already there, um, bringing in a new generation of artists and opening it more international. We started collaboration with a Swiss artist Nina Hab recently from Geneva, and we're planning on more collaborations with artists that uh, are in Switzerland, but as well with artists based in Berlin that I will uh, show you. It's connected to my personal also um, story because I used to live in Berlin for quite a long while, more than a decade. So I could uh, get in touch with, uh, uh, with many artists living there. And um, what you see on the photo is the interior of the exhibition of Maya Kitajewska from last year. She's uh, one of the youngest artists we represent. She studied painting and also textile. So the artworks you see, it's a mix of oil paint and embroidery, which is glass beads embroidery or sequins embroidery on canvas, uh, including in the middle, it's um, uh, fully embroidered uh, canvas uh, with uh, glass beads uh, that represent a form of a carpet, so it's a glass carpet, so to say. Uh, this slide shows the show of Jolanta Owicka from 2017. Uh, as you saw, the gallery was founded in 96, and the first solo show of Jolanta Owicka at the gallery was in 98. So it was a very early collaboration, uh, very important uh, for the gallery identity as well. And um, we not only stayed faithful to this collaboration, but also uh, it um, greatly defined uh, the program and the line of the gallery, making the sensibility for textile as one of the main focuses. Even though we don't represent uh, many uh, fiber artists, but uh, that's um, something that is uh, extremely important 
um, for uh, how we perceive ourselves and collaboration with uh, artists. Uh, so you can see here uh, the photo of the opening um, at the National Association of Artists in Warsaw that was um, the last exhibition that Yolanta Owicka could attend. It was a retrospective exhibition, kind of retrospective exhibition, because it wasn't as big as it should be to show the vast uh, oeuvre. Um, and uh, you can see on the left my father, who was uh, uh, invited to give a speech as a, as a long-time friend and curator of, uh, um, of her artworks. Um, we're thinking of uh, uh, making an um, exhibition um, next year in spring with featuring artworks of Jelanta Owicka as well in Warsaw and to reuse the video material we did back then in 2016 to make a larger uh, video uh, accessible to the public. Because until now it's only a shortcut of three minutes that's online. It was just used as a kind of teaser for the exhibition back then, but the material is much more than that. And I think it would be interesting to, to refresh that memory and also enrich it with some more uh, more materials available, such as images and interviews with other people. And uh, in case you are asking yourself, the person in the middle is uh, Joanna Owicka, it's uh, daughter of Jolanta Owicka, who also happens to be a fiber artist. So, in this slide you can see the exhibition in Warsaw at our gallery in 2019 with Aiko Tezuka, which is a Japanese artist based in Berlin, which makes a connection to what I was telling you before. And uh, the, uh, the artwork is called Rewoven because it uh, uh, makes a um, connection between two fabrics that are uh, that are entangled uh, in a new manner, so that uh, becomes uh, what you see in the middle. <clears throat> that's also her artworks we presented in the gallery, that they have this very strong, colorful, almost decorative uh, dimension. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I chose to show it and to tell you about it because I think it might be interesting for the for the conversation later because I was uh, surprised to hear from her how much um, importance she gave to the fact to say that uh, she is as well conceptual artist but it's a, a situation in the uh, contemporary art that uh, um, concept, concept is just as important as form. And it's a kind of, um, we can mm, include it in a broad category of marketing strategy <laughs> of the artists, right? How they want to describe their artworks in order to, uh, to be included in the group that is more uh, valued or more appreciated. So this is an uh, exhibition from the same year uh, that was during Warsaw Gallery Weekend in 2019 of Małgorzata Mirgatas that I curated and um, my great uh, pleasure was to see uh, that after that exhibition she was uh, um, awarded with several prizes in Poland and, uh, and uh, almost uh, not, not even a year later, she was qualified for Venice Biennial as a representative for Polish Pavilion. So you can see just uh, two artworks, very typical of her, this uh, folding screens. Uh, maybe you cannot see that very well on the photo, but it's, um, it's a patchwork uh, technique. So she's knitting, uh, she's sewing together pieces of fabrics that usually she finds in wardrobe of her family or friends or second, uh, second hand shops that she, uh, she's a regular uh, in uh, the place where she lives. 
So you can see the close-up of some other, uh, well, close-up, the reproduction of one artwork of her, this, this patchwork, that um, if you know her work a little bit better, then you will observe that many um, motives, they are repeating itself. And I don't mean only gesture or colors, but the whole situation is being reproduced several times. Uh, because it's connected to the fact that she works on family photo archive and uh, the images she produces basically are reproducing some situation that was photographed. This is the other artist that I would like to uh, talk about. Uh, that's Maya Kitajewska, the artist we saw the exhibition view just at the beginning of my uh, introduction. And, uh, I'm afraid you cannot really see the, with the screen the reverse very well, but <clears throat> it's uh, all embroidered. So as, you, as you see, that's one painting from that exhibition that it's oil paint, but with embroidery, it has this uh, quality that is shiny, so it really changes with the light, with the movement of the beholder. And that's something that I think particularly interesting as a kind of full circle going back to Jolanta Owicka, who said in several interviews that at the beginning of her career, she was very much against synthetic materials, but very soon she changed her mind and she couldn't imagine continuing her work without, um, without materials that are actually very contemporary. And um, as a funny memory, maybe, uh, I, uh, I remember from the recording of the, uh, of, from this interview that she said that, for example, molybden is a wonderful material uh, that looks like sil silver, it just doesn't get darker with time, and it's a material that's being used uh, for interstellar ships building. So, it's a, uh, in Polish it's do podróży międzyplanetarnych, which is... Um, an expression I have never heard from anybody really speaking, uh, using it spontaneously. It's a rather uh, very, uh, uh, very well, um, uh, well, it's, it was a person who, it was a great pleasure to listen to because her mastery of language was amazing, not only, uh, not only the uh, tapestry. So I think as an introduction, I think it's, that's the last. Ah, that's also Maya Kitajewska. So I wanted to show you that it's not only painting and canvas, which is very, um, uh, very typical uh, to find, especially in the context of art markets, uh, but as well objects. So you see the, on the left, uh, it's um, uh, objects um, from the series Beyond the Principle of Pleasure, and it's also soon from uh, glass beads. So there are these flowers that look like, uh, well, they're these glass flowers that eternally will stay the same, but it's with the sewing technique. And on the left, this uh, breast that's also kind of playing with art history and uh, making a connection to um, to some other fields that was also by uh, our uh, uh, by uh, people by, uh, who was attending the panel just before us. Uh, they, I remember, there was uh, uh, the concept of conversation of textile art with painting with other forms. I think that here we can uh, see the resonance of that idea. So. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction. So I think already we have so many contexts in play about exhibiting Polish artists in the international context and about exhibiting Japanese artists in the Polish context. So, you know, many kind of geographical and cultural intersections and also working with contemporary artists, but then also going back to the past and rediscovering um, talented but very often overlooked artists from the past. Um, and yesterday we heard um, 
several times at the opening of the triennial about the importance of the, of the Polish school of textile art and um, how important it is for, for the city, for, uh, for the museum and for the triennial happening. Um, and, you know, we, we are hearing a lot about Magdalena Bakanovich for years now and now with the Tate Show, but we're all aware of the fact that she is not the only one, right? And, and um, I want to ask you briefly, because you were speaking about Jolanta Owicka, you were speaking about uh, Barbara Lewitoszwiderska, how would you think of the position of the Polish School of Textile Art within the art market that you are working with? I mean, is it even like a category or like a notion that you think is in play in the art market that you are working with, or you know, they're just like single artist name popping out in there? And uh, yeah, so so if if I can ask you to just reflect on that. I. I think. Hello. There you go. <laughs> um, it's a really good question. And in short, not many people know about the Polish textile school, if I'm totally honest, in, from my view, in the commercial art world, specifically on an international scale. I think, as you say, it's artists in isolation. It's Magdalena Bakanowicz, it's Barbara Lewitusa-Derska, Jolanta Witzka. There are certain people that are emerging at that people are paying attention to, but I don't think that people are really recognizing that it's one particular school that emerged after World War II and the, how the depth and breadth of it, I think, is still very much undervalued and under uh, unknown, really. I think, and I think that's really across the board for fiber art in general. I think people are, because it's still developing in a commercial sense, I think that it's, it's slow to. And so artists from Latin America, taking for example, Olga de Amaral, the Colombian textile artist, there's obviously other Colombian textile artists, but ask anyone to name one and they probably can't. It's just Olga. And I think that's, it's quite a fascinating thing. Similarly with Croatia, Jagoda Buic, everyone knows who she is, but they can't name another single fiber or textile artists working from that region. And I think it's, it's obviously changing, but I think there's a lot of work to be done around it because the conversations that we have, not just with collectors on a private sense, but as well as institutions, is once you start explaining the history of, of textiles in Poland and the influence of the school and the diversity of the artists that were working and are working, it's quite eye-opening for them. And so I think it will be interesting in the next decade as more and more attention is being paid to Poland specifically. Um, and I think a lot of the Magdalena show at Tate will really help spur that on. It's gonna be interesting to see what comes out of that and what other artists will start to be recognized because you can go through catalogs and you know the Biennale's here and as well at Lausanne and it's overriding that so many of them come from this region. And I think it's, for me per personally, it's quite fascinating. And it's something that we know still, even ourselves, know very little about. And so we're excited to be working within that to see what we can help foster and bring out of it. Well, it's hard to say something uh, more insightful than you just did. Um, I will try just to say that Polish art market is... Uh, is a very small and particular, uh, of course, talking about uh, Polish textile in Poland is something that it's the best audience to, to do so in terms of knowledge. In terms of, uh, of money, while we're talking about market, it's a little bit uh, other, uh, other situation. So definitely, as each market, there is some national proud, there is some, uh, some knowledge that is here. And uh, 
while it's very hard to sell somebody who would be very cele celebrated uh, um, uh, abroad to, to sell it and present in Poland, it's very hard as well in other countries to bring something from outside and to make it uh, um, to make people recognize the value of it. So. Um, um, my compliments for your efforts. Uh, that's wonderful that you're doing this uh, great job and uh, everything seems you're doing it really right. So uh, I keep my fingers crossed. Uh, from my uh, point of view, I would say that, um, uh, well, my observation is maybe um, provocative, but uh, it kind of goes back to this conversation of textile with other uh, mediums. And um, I, have the f I have the feeling, impression, that artists who are not necessarily uh, associated uniquely to textile kind of manage to, f to make their position uh, and to reassure uh, the value of their also textile works. That would be maybe the case of Magdalena Bakanovic that we all know and, uh, and we connect with textile, but actually it's not the only medium she worked. And um, maybe um, actually there is this historical uh, fashion and, and tendencies that in the uh, 80s uh, assured Magdalena Bakanovic her strong position that, for example, Jolanta uh, struggled with uh, this kind of recognition, staying faithful to textile uh, and not uh, trying to, uh, to use other materials or to, to call it some kind of uh, installations, environments, but just staying uh, the same uh, in the attitude. Uh, so that's my observation and um, I think we can go... Uh, I'm, I'm very curious what you, what you say next. Yeah, I have a, like a follow-up question actually, also in relation to Tuawicka and Levito Um Because, I mean, we just have this conversation um, earlier today and, and we said that, you know, unlike the auction houses, for example, which just monetize the artistic production, like the role of the galleries is, is very different in the sense that it also connects to care, right? Like this working with artists and with their state. So I wanted to ask you to, to maybe say a few words of your experience and practice of working with the states of the of Jolantowicka and Barbara Lewitusz-Widerska and how, you know, the commercial side is also um, in parallel to, or, or I mean, this is just like one layer and then you have a layer of, of, of care or like research and how those different fields are, re are related and especially if we're speaking about artists that I think still are not visible enough, I mean, and, or, or like how do you work on uh, not only the, the the market position, but how do you work on, on their position as such, right? Like so, so how 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 would you um, how would you try to to make those artists visible in in the way that they, they should be, and and how um, how has it been for you in the in the last year while doing the work that you're doing with the with the state? We can we can start with you maybe this time, Kostek. Yes. So um, uh, about Jelanta Witska and the state that we work with, uh, the situation is uh, sometimes very challenging because, well, not anymore. But uh, I heard once somebody saying that um, activity in art market is mainly constructed from lost opportunities and uh, situations that are not recognized in the right moment because timing is everything and so on. Uh, and it happened that uh, there been auctioned several pieces uh, in a bit surprising moments sometimes and uh, and some other uh, pieces they were just um, not taken care of properly that were commissioned 
for example, for Hotel Victoria, there was a, a monumental uh, artwork that was just taken off and it was partially destroyed, as far as I know. So that was what was... Um, uh, rescued uh, was kind of just a part of it and um, in case of Yolanta Owicka we know that she she liked very much and enjoyed this commission work that was very big artworks and of course it's challenging if the institution uh, that is hosting that artwork changes the attitude toward their interior design and um, and that's maybe the most challenging part of taking care of what's what's um, there outside and uh, the other artworks that are in the state of course there are not so many uh, that we can think of uh, um, problems with connected with quantity but uh, we are thinking about uh, doing of course exhibitions but um, that's a very complex strategy actually what to do uh, and I think it's um, maybe a good idea is to put um, to arrange uh, exhibitions and presentations of these artworks connecting it to something that is more contemporary to show the contrast, show the, um, the inspiration that might have um, gone from there uh, and also um, endless effort uh, of explaining and telling about it and uh, this kind of pedagogical mission of the gallery that sometimes is very important, right? So, and uh, hopefully also uh, thanks to international collaborations, uh, art fairs, uh, that is uh, that is uh, possible to uh, to change a bit. Of course, uh, for example, this year's uh, Venice Biennial is very particular, not only because of the artists that I talked to you about, Małgorzata Mirgatas, but um, this um, special recognition of, uh, of female artists on one hand, on the other hand of uh, the skills and crafts that, as far as I can remember, wasn't really that present in Venice. And it's something's changing, so to say, in the air, and gives us a lot of hope that it's, uh, it's a stimulus uh, to, um, um, to come back to these artworks and look again uh, at them and to, to find the quality and, uh, and the depth of the idea and also uh, recontextualize it or even make some some speculation on how it is different to for example Olga de Amaral that you were mentioning uh, and how is the connection of Polish textile uh, artworks to the um, pre-Columbian cultures because there is a d different attitude in Poland there is a different tradition of that textile that maybe I'm uh, I'm fantasizing too much but my impression is that it's very little connected to folklore inspiration as it is in other countries uh, like this, uh, yeah, it's for example Sheila Hicks that uh, is a name that of course in art market is uh, a little bit omnipresent. Uh, there, there is this connection much stronger, right? Um, in case of uh, Yolanta Ovitska is actually a completely different attitude uh, in thinking of, uh, of a form of, uh, of uh, the artwork, I would say. I, is that on? Yeah. I wouldn't say I have much to add other than to quickly say and in terms of the care around an estate is the academic side in terms of publications because I think with these artist estates that we work with there's so, there's so little literature out there 
And it's very important to, as you say, recontextualize the artist. So to commission new texts and to create publications which have have images you know it's so important to be able to see the works even if they no longer exist or if it's just tradition or historical or archival installation images because a you're putting it into an art historical context but then you're allowing people to understand how they can replace it and resituate it and i think for us and i know you do as well we self-publish um, a lot of books on the artists that we work with and it's something that we will certainly continue to do because it's important for in an age where so much is digital it's important for people to have objects things to hold on to as referential tools and i think sometimes galleries forget how important that really is and i think it's something that we really want to continue to do in our program um, thank you and Another follow-up question, if, if you're speaking about textile, I mean Polish or just in general, um, I'm, I'm wondering about the, the collectors actually, or, or, or like the, how, how do you feel the textile art, especially I, I have in mind like a three-dimensional um, installations that are, you know, like, like that are not really handy to kind of have in the, in, in a collection. So, so while working with the with the textile artists and in their states, um, do you predominantly work with um, private collectors or public institutions? Do you feel like uh, private collectors have the awareness or, or are they ready to take, to, to collect the textile art or, or because I, I, I imagine it's, it's, it's very different if, if you consider like a, something as classic as, or like as easy in, in maintenance like painting, right? Or like a photography that you can just frame. So I'm, I'm wondering um, about the, the um, difficulties or the challenges into introducing um, uh, textile art uh, into in, into collections, and I I I I I I think that the private collections are, are very interesting here. So, how how do you feel um, this looks like? Um, it's actually a really good point, and it's something that a lot of our collectors bring up that are new to textile is this fear of of dust. Mm -hmm. They are petrified of dust. What do they do? And I just think it's so stupid because. Are you worried about the dust on your painting? No, you don't ask me that question. It's this fear of it for some reason. Moths are a different story and I completely understand that fear. But it's, I mean, for us, we have a textile care document. So everyone that buys a piece of fiber, a textile art is provided with this document which allows them to understand how to take care of it. Um, and, you know, with textiles, a lot of it is the same as with a photograph. If there's natural dyes, you obviously don't want to put it in front of an open window on a beach in Miami. You want to have UV glass, all of these things. So I think there definitely is a fear around it because it is such a new media to have in the home, despite the fact so many people have fiber all over their houses, you know, in the forms of couches, you know, designer cushions, things like that. Um, institutions obviously understand it and are aware. I actually think the issue that we have discovered with institutions lately, especially with some of the historical work, is access to cold storage, not having big enough facilities to accommodate some of these textile works that are coming in. And that's one sort of small hiccup I often find, and a lot of the large-scale works do take up space. Um, but, you know, space is always an issue. It doesn't matter what the media is. And that's not really going to change, I don't think. Um, and then in terms of the three-dimensional form of sculptures, fiber sculptures in a home, I think it's the same thing. I think that every collector is different and what they're willing to work with. You know, a lot of people don't like to live with sculptures in the home just as, as objects, necessarily. They prefer wall-based works. I think it's merely a matter of taste and some collectors are more exploratory and willing to take risks in that sense. Um, one of the things I do find quite fascinating, though, is a lot of our California collectors um, buy textiles much more than any other state. And I hadn't actually figured out why until someone said, if there's an earthquake, do you want a rug falling on your head or a glass framed photograph? And I thought, bloody hell, that's such a good point. Um, so yeah, California, hot market. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I think it's um, also <laughs> it's also time that um, many people realize, especially with the contemporary architecture, building this kind of big spaces that are empty, that there is an acoustical problem. Uh, and um, my experience with collectors who bought textile uh, was that they were amazed actually how the acoustic uh, experience of the space uh, was better and uh, and that's kind of side like side effect um, that's very positive of that and and sometimes people do, do just don't realize that there is a fashion of uh, of interior design such or such but then many things uh, are not being considered such as uh, sound for example and uh, this um, feeling of well, it's very often in connection to textile, especially in uh, in last century, there was uh, the discourse about protection feeling that the textile isolates and protects and give this kind of comfort that uh, no painting actually is able to give for the interior. And I think it's also coming back, not only as a discourse, but mainly as an experience and, and uh, consciousness for many people who, um, who take the risk to, uh, to collect textile. Then they are double happy for, so to say, in, in the end. And uh, let's hope that they will tell their collector friends that that was a good idea, right? I, I feel like we could be speaking here for not an hour, but let me just ask one last question. Um, so we were speaking about historical works, and, and Kostek, you, you, you mentioned the, the Venice Biennial as a, you know, like a specific ex example of, of the increasing visibility of, of craft and textiles also, in, in particular, in the institutional landscape, and, and I feel like this is very obvious for, for most of us here, and, and also if you consider documenta, right? If, if you consider, you know, the, the, the kind of really kind of pluriverse of like different kind of geographical, um, you know, attitudes and, and how um, it is the textiles that are able to communicate different uh, decolonial or like pre-colonial epistemologies, right? Or like some community work. And I feel like this is, we, we are seeing it so much in, in different exhibitions, in, in big institutions, in small institutions, this kind of attempt for the art world to be more democratic, the, to have more voices included, you know, and, and it really appears, or, or yeah, exactly with, with, with the community-based works, yeah? Like we, we are seeing also textiles being, um, appearing in that context as, as something that can connect to um, some traditional experience or, or also like a um, pre-modern, in, in a way, uh, attitude of, of, of different societies. So, um, but I'm wondering if we're seeing that in the institutional landscape, what do you make out of it in the in the in the commercial market right like is the the the, the commercial market able to respond in in what we are seeing in 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 those um you know th those tendencies or or not basically so so i'm wondering how um what, what we're actually seeing in 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 the in in these big exhibitions and and the the the, the things that we're observing how does it translate to the you know, to the sales actually, or like, is it um, something that has to has to has to be translated as a as a, as a processual thing? Maybe um, that's a that's a big question. But yeah, we have a couple of minutes, so let's maybe just um, touch up on the answer. Well, it's very hard to say. You know, it's. Um uh, I think every gallery has its own tricks in the sleeve, uh, how to uh, convince somebody that, uh, uh, that I wouldn't say there is no particular tendency connected to textile that uh, everybody could use as an argument. It's just, of course, it's coming back in the sense of um, appreciating the skill, the history, there is more knowledge about that again, so to say. But it's a general, general ambience. It's not a particular event, except maybe from Venice Biennial or Documenta, and um, 
And my experience is that uh, uh, that people who are not focusing in collecting particular things that they already know what they're looking for, if it comes to textile, it's more interesting for them, and I think that was uh, partially kidding, partially ser serious when I talked about Aiko Tezuka, that this kind of marketing strategy that she's uh, underlining the fact it's conceptual art, or it's this or that, but it's not mainly textile. So textile is like a third category, she, she says, because obviously it is. Uh, but um, yes, in case of historical artists, uh, like Jolanta Owicka again, or even Magdalena Bakanowicz, you would justify that for because of her history position shows that were collections that she's included in. But I don't think there is a special argument connected to textile itself. Mm, yes, maybe you you can tell something more enlightening. I'm not sure if this is any more enlightening and is even going to answer your question, but it, what you were saying just made me think that, and I've never actually recognized this before, is that our collectors, most collectors will have a specific media that they prefer, that they focus on. What's interesting with textiles is that I can't think of a single collector that focuses on textile or fiber art specifically in a private capacity. They will acquire works that are made using fiber, size, or whatever it may be, but it's, it's almost the afterthought. They're buying the work, the story, but it's not specific to the medium, whereas with photography, with painting, you have certain collectors that wouldn't touch you know, an acrylic on canvas. They only are, they're so purist in that sense. And I find that's actually really interesting to think about, that there is no specific movement in the commercial sense to focus purely on it as a media. And I actually think it stands it in good grounding because it will make it easier for it to flip into the fine art world and not be constrained by the media specificity of it. And I think that's actually really interesting to think about. Yeah. If I may sure. um, profit from the um, conversation, I would like to ask you uh, about the, the gallery in Rome and uh, context in Italy, because I know that you are quite present. Well, we, we met in uh, Geneva at the art fair, but you are also participating in art fairs in Italy and now having a gallery there. Is there a special particular thing in Italian uh, art market connected to textile or is it just for other reasons? There's nothing. <laughs> Uh, the Italians are not heavy on fiber and textile art, <laughs> um, which is, it's not a bad thing. I, no, I, Rome for us was for various other reasons, opening a space there, but I think that would actually be our weakest market, if I'm totally honest. Uh, I would say that the Americans and Swiss are stronger in that sense. Um, Americans are very open to the media, I would say, yeah, it's definitely our strongest market with institutions as well as private individuals. Yeah, well, with Swiss, it's quite uh, quite a long story, right? That we all know, uh, with foundations and, and uh, Lausanne and uh, and collections that are quite famous. So, I think there is some kind of continuity uh, of that. Thank you. I guess our time is up. But uh, maybe we can have another, you know, two minutes if there is. Any question from from the audience? I mean, we can we can take one or two, maybe, if there are any. My name is Beatrice Sterk from Textile Form Block, and I wanted to ask um, Annie Albers, for example, her work must be much more higher in price now. Is she still very much under Joseph Albers? And that is an argument to sell textiles, isn't it? Uh, is there any other questions? So maybe we can collect the, and, and answer all of them. Yes, uh, it, it's, it's 
not related. It's, it's actually back to the period of what I think of as amazing commissions. It was partly a different kind of state, if I could say. I remember my Professor Ursula Plevka Schmidt, who I think is massively underrated, and the very large crochet formed installations I saw in many hotels. Mm -hmm. And I've got images of those. But I wonder what has happened to them since. And I think your story of Odvitska is a very telling one. And I think there are many works around that have somewhat been cut, disappeared, destroyed, and all we're left with is images. But those images must be presented and published because otherwise we don't have archival histories. So that was a fantastic point. Thank you. Thank you. Everything is a question if you want it to be. <laughs> so could you repeat the question that we had? Um, so, so the question, if I'm getting it right, was about Annie Albers and uh, how is her position now also in the, in the relation to market but also uh, in the relation to her being um, of Josef Albers also. So, so how is the, the gender dynamics reflect? It's okay, you, you say it best. As an argu argument for all the textile artists. Right. Did, did you hear that? Well, if textile artists are undervaluated, then they must be sold with the idea, look, you buy something very special and very cheap because he is not recognized at this moment yet. Uh, and and uh, I made a... Um, uh, example of Annie Albers, who is uh, maybe 10 times undervalued, and now she comes up. Thank you. It's a, it's a very good point, and everyone in this room should be buying work by female fiber artists whenever you can from that generation, <laughs> because <laughs> they are so drastically undervalued. You're absolutely correct, and that will change in the next 10, 20 years. So, yes, you know, Annie Albers' prices have gone up significantly. <laughs> Olga de Amaral's with the recent retrospective, all of these artists, as more and more attention is paid to them, their prices will increase. So as, as an investment, go forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. That's, <laughs> that's obviously, the do, obviously uh, um, the truth and only truth. Um, maybe uh, it's only to have in the back of the mind that um, uh, art market has also this logic of stars and uh, and many people who are in the shadow of these big names. So, not uh, maybe buying not every uh, fiber uh, artwork, but uh, kind of focusing on on uh, some historical figures. That for sure, it's a good uh, good idea of investment when we already talking um, about markets or uh, also um, having the courage to discover something something younger maybe something new as i as i tried to show you the artworks and artists uh, in my presentation that uh, i strongly believe that they have uh, a very interesting future and careers uh, ahead um, Sometimes the problem is, for example, in case of Maya Kitajewska, she uh, used uh, in her artworks a lot of plastic gold sequins that she embroidered. And uh, that's not exactly the um, uh, visual aesthetic that in Poland is very popular because um, uh, the, the color of gold, it uh, has still kind of cliché associations. So it's completely different in case of Olga de Amaral, where this gold uh, explains itself from a different tradition. In case of Kitajewska, it's about plastic and about this cheap material, synthetic material, that is actually playing a lot with uh, fashion design and, and uh, hip-hop culture, for example. So it's different uh, references and uh, we will see how it's developed. I, I'm very optimistic about the future of Polish visual culture and I, I strongly believe that gold will come back as a color. <laughs> so. 
Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I feel like this has been a very productive and uh, inspiring conversation, and I feel like we should have more of them also as a person working in the public institution. You know, we're all in the same ecosystem, and in order for it to be sustainable, especially that we are just discussing the, the notions of care and research and, and you know, rediscovering some, some figures and some legacies that have been... Um, not visible at all, right? So, so I feel there is a role to play um, from the side of the private sector and, and the public sector, and, and I feel like this is a very important conversation to, to continue. Um, so, thank you very much, Constante, and thank you very much, Neef, and thank you very much uh, for listening to us. Um, and this is also the last panel today, so um, yeah, I would like also to express my gratitude to the organizers and um, yeah, it has been a very inspiring um, Sunday, so thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, thank you very much uh, for also summing up the whole uh, day, the whole symp symposium, but because I felt it was like this. Uh, I would like to invite all the panelists here on the stage so that we could have a photo together. Uh, please, so please, everyone who who is still here, Marta, come come and uh, yeah, let's. Let's have a photo, if I can ask you. And, of course, you are all welcome uh, to the City Gallery in Park Sienkiewicza, where we have our Young Textile Art Triennial uh, opening. And it's at 4 p.m. So, uh, yeah, we, we want to see you there. You are welcome. Thank you. <laughs>